All right, welcome. Uh, in this video, I want to pivot. In the last couple of videos, we've talked about logic and propositions. And now I want to talk about another foundation or important uh, part of, of math and computer science, which is set theory. Uh, and set theory, uh, in some ways, is very closely related to the logic that we've just been studying. We're going to apply logic uh, to do uh, to define some of our our terms in set theory, uh, and then we're also going to use logic when we try and reason about uh, sets and and different propositions or theorems that we can prove about sets. Um, and then another important sort of parallel to logic is, as I've mentioned in the last previous in the previous couple of videos. Um, we already have an internal uh, logical computer in our brain that, that uh, functions implicitly for us and intuitively for us all the time. And in the same way, we already have built into us an implicit understanding of what a set is. Our mind uh, is built to form sets and uh, test for membership in sets um, uh, are very concepts are formed in this way. So this means that what we're trying to do again, just like we've been doing with logic in the last couple of videos, is we're trying to make explicit something that we already do naturally, implicitly, uh, and intuitively. So let's do that by taking a look at our first collection of sets or our first definition and our first couple sets. So our definition of a set that I've got here uh, is, is a set is going to be a collection of elements or members. We sometimes call the elements members. We sometimes give them different names, um, but elements is sort of the common one. Uh, we talk about members too because being a member of a set is usually the most important property uh, of sets, is, is checking to see if something is a member or not. So let's take a look at a couple sets that might be uh, uh, of interest to us. So the first one I have here, uh, it's stated in English, I stated as the set of all presidents of the United States. Uh, I currently reside in the United States um, and our current uh, president uh, as of uh, July 1st, 2020, and that's when I'm making this video, is Donald Trump. Uh, and so we could imagine that we could have the set, the collection of elements, here the elements that we have are people, our actual presidents of the United States. And then the, the set is collecting them all together under one uh, sort of banner. And the, the phrase, Presidents of the United States, might be the name of that set because that phrase uh, captures what all the members of that set have in common. They're all Presidents of the United States. Now, I'm not actually an American, so I couldn't tell you all the Presidents of the United States. I know the first one was George Washington. I know that enough. Uh, I moved here in 2013 and so my president then was Barack Obama and now I know Donald Trump. I know of a couple other presidents as well, um, you know, those that, uh, you know, JFK, John F. Kennedy, uh, Abraham Lincoln, these are famous ones that, you know, I've heard enough in pop culture. You might know some uh, as well. If you're an American, then you might know more than that. You might actually know all of the presidents of the United States now. Um, I might get my number wrong here. I'm sure someone will correct me. I think there's been um, something like 45? 40, 45 is my guess. I'm sticking with it. 45. I think Donald Trump is number 45. I'm not 100% sure if that's true. Maybe he's 44. Maybe he's 42. I don't know. Um, but something in the 40s in terms of number of presidents. So we could see that we we, one thing we can see about this list of presidents, I've got this dot, dot, dot in here, this ellipsis in here, sort of to fill in the dots of all the ones that I've skipped over, but we know that there's some finite number. Now, I, there is a little bit here we might question about here. It says the set of all presidents of the United States. Well, um, maybe I'm not being exactly precise here. If I want to be 100% precise, what I have is the set of all presidents of the United States up to and including Donald Trump because there is presumably going to be more presidents of the United States coming after Donald Trump. So um, we're in an election cycle right now where it seems like uh, 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 Biden might be the Democratic nominee and he might be the next uh, uh, president of the United States, at which point we might imagine this set expanding to include another member. So in some sense, this set here has a temporal identity. As time goes on, it might change, membership might change. 
Or we might think, well, maybe we don't want one that changes over time. If we really want the set of all presidents of the United States, that would include the, the past presidents, the current president, but also all potential future presidents, whoever that might be. Now that set exists, we just at the moment, those of us residing in 2020, don't know the other members of that set. Um, if, you, if you happen to be residing in the future, you might know some of the members of that, that set. Okay, I don't. Um, um, but we could imagine it being, you know, this, it's still existing, this set. And I am going to make sort of the, 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 uh, the dark prediction, at least, that there's probably going to be a last president of the United States. Just, you know, the sun might die at some point. Let's hope that it's, it's around then. Um, you know, there, there's probably going to be a point in the time where humans don't exist. So there must be someone who would be the last president of the United States. So that would complete the, the list. When we get to that last president, um, then that would close off this set. Um, and that would, again, we imagine that would be a finite number. So again, this is the set, one possible set. Let's look at another set. So here's another set. I'm going to talk a little bit more about sets of numbers in more detail. But the set of natural numbers is a um, very commonly used set, a set that's been known to human beings for a very, very long time. These are the set of counting numbers. So as soon as humans started counting, uh, we started investigating this set. Now, the, here the ellipsis is meant to fill in the ones that, um, that are missing. But here it's necessary that, that we use the ellipsis because this set is infinite in size. Um, and while there are very likely uh, members of my audience who know all the presidents of the United States, um, there is no member of my audience who knows every natural number, um, or ha it's impossible to know every natural number or even conceive of every natural number because there are infinite of them. Uh, but here we've got the set stated uh, kind of simply as sort of zero, one, two, and then I just say dot, 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 you fill in the rest. Hopefully you realize I mean going on forever. I'll say more about numbers uh, in a second when we when we look at more sets. Here's another set, uh, one that we're probably familiar with. If you're listening uh, to this in English, then you probably speak English, so you're familiar with the English alphabet. Um, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, uh, up to up to uh, Z or Z as I call it from my native Canada. Um, Twenty six characters in this set. Okay. Now this is a set of characters in the English alphabet. If you're a computer scientist, which I anticipate many of you are, then there's another set of characters you might be familiar with, which is the ASCII set. Now the ASCII set are the set of characters that you might be able to create um, uh, in a text file, for instance. Of course, Unicode exists, which is an, an expanded version of that. But that set includes this set. So that's something we might be uh, talking about again in the future. We, we're going to talk about subsets. So this is a subset of the ASCII set. These are the lowercase letters. ASCII also includes uppercase letters as well. All right, and here I've just sort of picked out another one here, um, the set of Harry Potter's books. Um, uh, here we have, uh, again, I, I, I guess I picked this out just thinking uh, it might be another interesting example. I haven't actually read the Harry Potter books, so I actually don't remember them all. I think I've seen most of the, the films. I didn't watch the last couple, so I don't really remember. But, you know, a Google was enough for me to, to know this. Um, I think um, the, the first book here, I know it as the Philosopher's Stone. I think actually here in America it was called um, the Sorcerer's Stone. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you if if you uh, know what I'm talking about uh, there was some copyright issue uh, but uh, let's assume there was no copyright issue and we all know the the same set then I think there were seven books in the set and so the, again you could imagine this as a set of books so one thing we've got here is a set is a collection of elements I've been incredibly vague about what the elements are here we have one set which are people um, here's another one which are books, here's one with characters, here's one which are numbers, all different kinds of sets. It seems at least for the moment that um, 
we've we've got only one kind of thing in a set like a people here and numbers here and so on can we make a set that has donald trump in it the number two the letter o and the deathly howl howls in it yes you can that's a perfectly okay set all that matters about sets is you've got members you have things in them okay now that set that includes all those weird things is probably a weird set probably not a very useful set it's probably not factoring into any of our programs or logic but we can make it as an example set just to describe what kind of sets we might encounter. So what kind of things can we say about sets? Well, one thing you maybe noticed already is that I put all my sets inside these curly braces. Okay, so braces, you know, is a, is a way, is often the, the name that we give these, I call them curly braces to, refine, to remind ourselves that I mean these curly kind. To not be confused with other types of round braces or brackets like this or square brackets that usually mean something different when we use them formally in mathematical uh, notation or mathematical language. So the curly braces are usually used to signify for us that we mean a set. Okay, so while we're using sets, I'll always use curly braces. And of course, hopefully you will use that in your own notation as well. Uh, what else can we comment about sets? Well, one thing that's important about sets is that they are collections, but that the order that we state them does not matter. Okay, so here I've got an example. The set 1, 2, 3 is equal to the set 3, 2, 1 is equal to the set 2, 1, 3. These are all the same set. And that's because what makes a set a set um, are the members of the set. Which, which elements are members and which elements are not members. So in this case, the elements 1, 2, and 3 are, are members of this set. Uh, and we could state that in different ways. Now, I've also stated here sort of parenthetically that we'll sometimes state our set in, in a conventional order. So this set here, um, the set that contains the elements 1, 2, and 3, will usually conventionally write it in the first hand here, the 1, 2, 3, just because that's the order these numbers come in in their conventional ordering. So we would we would just put them in that order for the convenience of, of whoever's reading it. And because it would be ambiguous, um, to state this set in its one of these various different ways. Um, if we want to be unambiguous, we'll often uh, adopt some convention, but the actual ordering does not matter. These are all the same set. The other thing that is important uh, about sets is that we usually do not permit duplicates. Again, if membership is all that matters, then you can't have something that is a member of the set more than once. Now, occasionally in our mathematics, um, so in, in normal, uh, sort of the normal way we apply sets in, implicitly and intuitively in our own day-to-day -day life, usually a thing is either a member or not. It's not a member two times or four times or something like that. But once we start using this as a mathematical object, we might say, oh no, there might be situations where we do want to allow something to be a member of a set more than once, in which case we call that a multi-set just to signify to ourselves we don't mean strictly a set, one that can have duplicates as well. All right, so I've sort of been stressing this already, but I've said this maybe a couple times. All that matters to a set is which elements are counted as members. So we call this membership. And we use this symbol here, this sort of curvy E symbol here, to mean is an element of. So here, this symbology here, lowercase s, curvy E, uppercase s, means the lowercase s is an element of the uppercase s. And here, these are variables standing in for, for something else. Uh, usually we use uh, capital uh, uh, letters for uh, the names of sets. Here I've got another uh, example of a set. Um, and here I use this capital E, but a double bar E. This is a common thing we use when we want to name sets of numbers. So you may have noticed on the previous slide, I used a double bar N for the natural numbers. Well, double bar is usually used to signify that we have a, a set of numbers. And so here I'm using it again. This is not conventional. We don't usually set the, uh, call the, the set of even numbers E. I'm just giving it a name here, E. Um, and here I've got this as stated as the set of even natural numbers, um, 0, 2, 4, and so on. There is an infinite in members. But now using our, our membership notation here, we can now state that 4 is an even number by saying 4 is an element of the even numbers. 5, an odd number, is not an element of the even numbers. Another example I have here, 
um, we could say let V be the set of vowels. Notice no double bar here because we're not talking about numbers anymore, just normal uppercase V. Uh, I, of course, V uh, for vowel. Uh, here are the characters that are vowels, and again, we can use our notation to say, okay, A is a vowel, A is an element of the set of vowels, and B is not an element of the set of vowels, and so on. So again, this notation, fairly straightforward. All right, so I mentioned uh, the set of natural numbers already. Um, so that's our first one here. Um, and again, I'm using the ellipsis here to indicate uh, that I mean uh, all infinite mem members uh, of the, the set of natural numbers. And as uh, mathematicians, we are already uh, aware of other sets of integers or set, uh, sets of numbers as well. The first is the integers. The integers includes now the negative numbers. So you might imagine going down a uh, sort of a journey here, mathematical journey, either through the history of mathematics or through the history of your own uh, learning about mathematics. Um, first, we had just the natural numbers, the counting numbers, um, and you know, in, in the history, we might have used those to you know keep track of how many sheep we have, or or how much grain I want to trade for 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 your chickens, or so on. Um, but at some point. Uh, our mathematical needs got far enough that we needed to know, well, what was 5 minus 8? Um, well, that was minus 3, and we needed to expand our numerical system to include negative numbers as well. Again, um, uh, there's a sort of special set, the positive integers, that doesn't include our, our 0 here, which is also sometimes privil privileged. Um, and for the set of integers, we'll usually use uh, this this character Z or Z and now I'm not exactly sure why they've done that conventionally I guess I could probably look it up. I probably would have used I uh, But you know I for integer um, but conventionally and traditionally we've used Z um, And then uh, we use this superscript of plus if we mean the positive and minus if we if we mean the negatives So here I've only got the positive one indicated um, again, maybe in your, you know, after we've figured out what, that we need negatives to handle uh, subtraction, uh, maybe we start doing some division and we realize we actually need uh, fractions as well, or more commonly as we call them uh, in, in mathematics, we call them the rational numbers. That's where we can take any number. So here I've got a very interesting way of stating a set. This is called set builder notation. Or in set builder notation, we still use the curly braces to indicate that we have a set, but in the set builder notation, we're going to have a vertical bar appearing somewhere in there. And that vertical bar is read as such that. So what this set, we can read this set to mean as that this is going to be a P divided by a Q. So all the numbers in, in the set of rationals is a P divided by a Q, such that P and Q are integers. P and Q are integers, and this is an important little side piece, uh, Q can't be zero. We can't divide by zero, right? So Q has to be a non-zero integer, P has to be any integer, and sometimes, sometimes we add to this definition that Q has to be positive. So if we want to make this thing negative, P has to be the negative part. But this then is a set of rational numbers. So again, let's read this all out one last time. This means p divided by q, all rational numbers are p divided by q, such that p is an integer, q is an integer, and q can't be zero. Okay, so any number that satisfies that definition is a rational number. Okay, so uh, continuing, uh, what other numbers do we have? Well, um, pushing even further, we could add what are called the irrational numbers, and you might know some, pick your favorite irrational. Uh, maybe you like pi or you like e uh, or square root of 2. That's one of my favorites. Uh, all these numbers cannot be expressed as a integer divided by an integer like a rational number can. And so we call these irrational numbers and adding them into the set of rational numbers gives us the set of real numbers. And the set of real numbers, well, here I'm using number line uh, notation, which you might be familiar with from, say, a calculus class. Um, here we're using the round braces, um, and if you remember in our, our interval 
notation. Round braces means not including and square braces means including. So what this means is going from minus infinity up to infinity, including all the numbers, but not including minus infinity and infinity, which technically are not numbers. They are they're sort of a special privileged kind of numerical entity that they themselves are not numbers. And, and that's because they perform in bizarre ways. When you take infinity and you minus off infinity, it doesn't always give you zero like you would expect with a normal number and so on. So here are another set. And, and for your mathematical explorations, you may have gone this far. You might not have explored the complex numbers other than to maybe just know what they are. But here's another definition, a complex number. This is a standard definition of a complex number. The complex numbers have an imaginary component. Remember this number i, which is the square root of minus 1, which expands our number system to include square roots of negative numbers now. Okay? And once we have uh, roots of negative numbers, um, we can have complex numbers. And every complex number can be expressed as a real component and an imaginary component written as alpha plus beta i. i again being the square root of negative 1. Here, alpha and beta are both real numbers taken from the set of real numbers above. Okay, and This will give us the set of complex numbers. And in fact, there are more numbers that we can define beyond these, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time in a future video talking about these sets of numbers in more detail and how we can characterize them and prove certain interesting properties about them. Um, but for now, this is merely just to flex our, our new set theory definitions to say, okay, we're already familiar with a large number of sets of numbers that we've, that we've encountered through our mathematical exploration. So I have mentioned this already for, for the rational numbers and the complex numbers. We use set builder notation where we have this such that. And here it is just stated sort of more simply. Um, when you want to set, state a, a set, you might say, you know, all x's such that x has some property. The set of all x such that x has some property. That's how we read that out. Uh, and we might use that, for instance, uh, to define the even numbers or odd numbers in a slightly different way. And we're going to do that here in a second. Uh, okay, so another definition that we can rely on. A lot of what I want to do here is just to find some uh, terminology that we're, we are going to use while we talk about sets. Um, and so one of them is subset, which I've already used once or twice. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to just talk about sets without bringing in some of these terminology already. So we talked about what a subset is. Let's, let's formalize this, make a formal definition. So a set A is a subset, that's the word I'm defining, that's why I've highlighted it in red, of a set B. So we've got these two sets A and B that are already sets. A is a subset of B, and we denote that. Now, the denoted means this is the way that we symbolize it. This is the mathematical symbolization that we use uh, to simplify things. Instead of writing in English A is a subset of B like that, we'll just write this symbol. And then the definition of what it means to be a subset is given here, I've got that highlighted in blue, saying if A is an element of A, so if we have some, some element that is an element of A, then it must also be an element of B. So if A is a subset of B, then if A is an element of A, then A must be an element of B. So another way of saying that is every element of A must be an element of B. And that's exactly what we understand a subset to be. A is a subset of B if it's contained in, in B, if, a, if every element in A is also in B. Um, I've also got a definition here of what it means to be a superset. Well, that's just the opposite relation. If A is a subset of B, then B is a superset of A. And we have a reverse symbol if we want, or sometimes we just turn it around backwards like I've done here. So this is again our idea of what a subset is or a superset. Um, the numbers that we, the number sets that we were just looking at here already have a subset relationship. Um, the positives are a subset of the naturals. The naturals are a subset of the integers. The integers are a subset of the rationals. The rational is a subset of the reals. And reals are a subset of the, of the complex numbers. Um, and we also have another symbol. You'll notice this subset symbol sort of looks like a less than equal to, and that's sort of where we borrowed it from. Other, other than that, it's just a little curvier. Okay. Um, and so we also have a strictly less than version, which means proper subset or subset but not equal to. Okay. So a subset but not equal to. So maybe that's something that's important for us to stress 
that according to this definition of subset, A is a subset of A. So a set is always a subset of itself. We'll call you a proper subset if you're actually missing some elements out. You're not exactly equal. So this notation we might think of as like less than equal means subset or equal. This, uh, this notation means proper subset or subset but not equal. It turns out for all the sets that we've got here, uh, this relationship is a proper relationship. There's always one uh, number that exists in the superset that does not exist in the subset. Uh, these are examples with numbers. Uh, I've just got another example. We had our set of uh, uh, alphabet, our English alphabet, and then in the previous slide we defined the set of vowels too. Well now with this notation we can say uh, V is a subset of A. So the vowels are a subset of the alphabet. All right, another, now that we've got the definition of what a subset is, we can define a couple other important sets. Um, one thing I haven't really stated so far is what are the sets of? We've said this, you know, sets could be sets of presidents, sets could be sets of books or numbers or characters. Is there anything that couldn't be in a set? And the answer to that is no. There is no thing so if it, as long as it counts as a thing, and, and I'm being very broad with thing here, love counts as a thing, unicorns count as a thing, lots of things count as things. If it's got thinginess, meaning you can talk about it, it's probably a thing, then it can belong in a set. Okay, so what about love? Can love belong in a set? Sure, a set of emotions or, or um, uh, feelings you can have for other individuals. Um, you know, uh, unicorns, can those be in a set? Sure, how about a set of mythical uh, creatures? Um, there are all kinds of, uh, all different kinds of things. Anything you can think of could potentially be in a set. So we very intentionally left our definition of things vague. There is no definition of what a thing is. A thing is just anything. That's the reason why we have thing. If, if uh, you're thinking like a programmer, and I know a lot of my audience are Java programmers. In Java, um, everything in Java is an object, right? Everything inherits from object on the top level. Well, think of that in a conceptual way. The word thing is the same thing. Every single concept, every single thing that you can ever come up with falls under the category thing thing is the highest, most uh, concept that you have, and anything that you could ever possibly encounter will be a member of that category. Now that's a very special category. The thing that, in the category, the set, we're now talking about sets, right? The set that has everything in it, the set of all things, we call that in set theory, we call it the universal set the set of all things. And again here, I'm being very vague about what I mean by things, and I've, in, I've sort of stated here that the universal set includes all numbers, all characters, all particles in the physical universe, that's interesting, um, all people, including the past, the present, and the future. I include all dragons here as well, so Puff the Magic Dragon and Drogan and whatever your favorite dragon happens to be, they're all there too as well as dot 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 all the other possible things okay even things that haven't been thought up yet like you know ligers or whatever something you can just make up you know grab grab two things merge them together in your brain uh, draw a picture of them whatever it is that's a new thing it's in the set of all things too okay so all things past present future real or imaginary all possible things now we call this the set where we call this set the universal set However, sometimes for convenience um, and for context, we're gonna, we're gonna drop a lot of things out of our set. So a common thing we might do is say, okay, no, but we're gonna restrict our, our focus to just the natural numbers. Once we do that, we basically said, okay, no unicorns allowed. Everything else has to be stripped out. The only thing in our universal set now are gonna be natural numbers. And now we can do number theory, maybe. We can, do, we can start talking about prime numbers or composite numbers or other things that might, we might wanna talk about in that context. But in general, if, uh, if not stated otherwise, the universal set is all the stuff, anything, okay? Um, so a little bit more formally, we can define the universal set and I sort of hinted at it in my definition. Uh, it, one way of saying is that it's a set such that every other set, other set, the not equal to you here means other set. So 
the universal set such that every other set is going to be a subset or equal to. Now remember, you could also be a subset of itself. We, we count that, but we don't want to set up here some kind of... Uh, uh, well, sometimes this, this isn't going to ca cause ourselves a problem when it comes to subsets, but we sometimes get this definition in terms of membership. We don't want a set to be a member of itself. And this is just a weird aside that I, maybe I'm just bringing up just to point out a little his, history lesson that when set theory uh, was first really uh, uh, coming, coming alive in mathematics, I'm going to say that's about 130-ish years ago uh, is when it started. There was a, there was a big uh, discussion about um, uh, sort of how set theory works and, and you know are there problems with set theory and one problem arose if a set could be a member of itself if a set could be a member of itself it caused this problem so here i'm trying to be very clear that i'm saying um, this is not going to be the case but uh, again the definition that i have here is very it, it ties into our intuitive definition which is every set is a subset of the universal set or everything is a member of the universal set okay everything is a member of the universal set except the universal set itself. That's the, that's the, the key. Um, the opposite side of that then, if the universal set is the thing that has everything in it, then there's also a set that has nothing in it. And we call this the empty set. And we sometimes just draw it like this, an open and closing brace with nothing in it. But we also have a symbol for it, which is this zero with a slash through it. Um, we usually uh, uh, use this symbol to identify the empty set. Okay, and that's the set with no members in it, with nothing in it. Or another way of saying that is the empty set is a subset of every other set. So that's something that uh, I'm going to try and prove now. Okay, now here, um, this is really our first sort of formal proof. And I haven't actually got talking about proofs yet, but the next couple of videos after this one is all going to be about proofs, kinds of proofs, how to prove, and then really this whole series of videos for the rest uh, of the series is just going to be proofs, proofs about different kinds of things, proofs about algorithms, proofs about running times, and so on. And so um, we're going to do our first proof. What are we doing when we write a proof? We're trying to prove a proposition. And so I've got stated here a proposition and it looks kind of logic-y, right? It's got the if-then in there, right? This is what I'm trying to prove. And then, and then secondly, when we're trying to prove a proposition, we'll often give that proposition a special name. We call it a theorem. Um, and it's a theorem uh, technically after we prove it, because then it's true. A theorem means it's true. Um, uh, and so uh, and before we prove it, if we're not really sure if it's true or not, we might call it something else like a hypothesis or a conjecture. But then after we prove it true, we call it a theorem. Since I've already proved this that, you know, on my slide, I'm, I'm calling it a theorem now, um, anticipating that our proof is going to show up here in a second. Uh, so let's just look at this. It's saying if S is a set, then the empty set must be a subset of S. Now, to prove this, we need to know a couple things. First of all, how do we prove an if-then statement? This is a conditional, and a lot of our proofs are going to be of this form. If some uh, starting conditions hold, then something else holds. Um, and then the second thing we need to know is what about the definition of subset? Well, on a previous slide, we had what the definition of a subset was. So if there's a member of this set, it must be a member of this set as well. Remember, that was our definition. Uh, we had A as a subset of B, and we said if A was a, su a, sorry, if a, was a member of A, then A must be a member of B. Putting that differently, if S is a member of the empty set, then S must be a member of S. So that's what we need to prove. So I'm going to let's look at take a look at our proof here. So to show that the empty set is a subset of S. Now, this phrase here is just telling my reader what I'm trying to prove, which is this. Okay. How do we do it? Now I'm telling you what I how I'm going to prove it by reaching into the definition of a subset and seeing what that definition was. That definition in here I've got it stated with this this variable x, if x is an element of the empty set, then x must be an element of s. Okay, now what we're going to say, since there are no elements of the empty set, since there are no x's that are in, in uh, the empty set, 
the antecedent is false and thus the conditional is true. Now this, this might, this might confuse some of us. So let's, let's parse this out. Let's break it down. What is the antecedent? Well, the antecedent, when you have an if then, we looked at this in, in our previous, when we were looking in the logic and we talked about if and then, I don't think I, I defined it as an antecedent. The antecedent is the first part, okay? And the consequent is the second part. Okay, we're actually trying to prove this, this one here, but the actual one that, that we're talking about here is this if then, look at this if then. The antecedent is x is an element of the empty set, and the consequent is what comes after the then is the x is an element of s. Now remember, when we have if a then b, if you have if a then b, if the a part was false, the whole thing was true. Right? If the first thing was false, if the antecedent was false, the whole thing was true. So that's what we're just staying, stating here. Since the first part is false, since there are no x's in the empty set, the whole statement is true by what we call vacuously. Vacuously true meaning it's empty, there's nothing there to prove. We don't have to prove anything. Okay? And since this is a proof about the empty set, which itself is empty, uh, what we have to prove here is nothing. There's nothing we need to prove to show that the empty set is a subset of another set. And so really I've just stated that in a, in a couple sentences here to try and convince you, the reader or the listener, that this is indeed true. Now the other thing I want to maybe point out in our proof, again I'll probably highlight this in another video, is I've started my proof off here with the word proof in the colon. That's, that's to indicate to my reader that here comes the proof. This square box over here is to indicate to the reader, okay, proof is completed. This means QED, QED, which is Latin, I believe. It might be Greek. I'm not good at these ancient languages. It's Latin or Greek um, for me, for uh, that which was to be proven. That which was to be proven. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, which means basically saying at the end, and therefore I'm done. Therefore I've proven what I'm trying to prove. Okay, and this is sort of an interesting thing that is true about proofs. This is a very short proof, so it's not always true for the short ones, but often in a proof, you're gonna go through sort of three steps. And the three steps I, I like to say is, uh, say what you're gonna do. So we said that here, to show, to show this, here's what we need to do. Do it, that was the next bit. And then say you did it at the end. At the end, say, aha, we're done. Take a look, I finished what I said I was gonna do. And that's sort of how a good proof proceeds. Uh, one, say, say what you're gonna do and tell your reader how you're gonna do it. Go ahead and do it so they can follow along with you, they know what to expect. And then when you're done, point out and say, okay, look, I did what I said I was gonna do, so you should believe me now. What should you believe me? That if S is a set, then the empty set is a subset of it. So hopefully you believe me of that. If you don't, then it's possible you misunderstand one of the uh, definitions that we went through um, so I, I recommend fire off a question and see if I can fill, uh, fill in that gap in your knowledge. Or maybe stay tuned for a future video where we're going to talk about proofs in a lot more detail uh, and you, might, you might, might fill in some details there. This was just our first example of a proof. It's a couple kinds of proof. It's a vacuous proof. I mentioned this meaning there's nothing really there to prove. It's also a direct proof. We'll talk again more about that in a future video. All right, uh, another definition that I, I want to set up here, both notationally uh, and just because it's something that we've been talking about already, is the size of a set. So I've already said, you know, the size of the number of presidents is like 45. That was my guess. I don't remember if that's the case. The size of, you know, the set of uh, alphabet characters is, in the English alphabet is 26, right? The size of the natural numbers is infinite. So that's, you know, that's something that we might want to say too. So we also denote that using these vertical bars around our set, which is sometimes also called the norm, the norm of S, um, looks like an absolute value, right? Is uh, just, it's sometimes called the cardinality of the set or the number of members in the set. We call this the size of the set. So um, for any set that we're going to consider, uh, the size of the set is either going to be a natural number, which means no sets are of size 3.5 or of size pi, um, and, uh, or they're going to be uh, infinite. Okay. I guess natural number also rules out uh, 
negatives. There's no set of size negative 2. Okay. Um, natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, and so on, or in, in uh, infinity. Your size could be infinity or infinite. So uh, if your size is a natural number, we'll say the set is finite. Otherwise, we say it's infinite. These are just following our normal uh, use of those, those words. And here are a couple examples. The size of the empty set is 0. The size of the natural numbers is infinite. And then here, let's look at this set builder notation again. This is a very common kind of way to use set builder notation. X is an element of the natural number. So this first bit is telling us sort of the universe that we're coming from, the universal set. We're saying, for the moment, just restrict yourselves to natural numbers, okay? Then the such that comes in to tell us the special property about natural numbers that we're, we're concerned with, the ones that are less than or equal to 10. So this set, I could have also stated it as just being the set of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And if we listed them all out, we could quite easily uh, count them and see that indeed because the zeros in there, there are 11 such elements. So again, natural number, natural number, not a natural number, but infinity, the other possible size that we could have for our sets. Okay, so let's take a look at another, uh, now that we know what the size of a set is, we can start talking about another interesting property, which is we've got this definition of a subset. What about, is so if we've got a particular set, let's say we have a set here, S. Okay, so that's how my definition is starting out here. Let S be a set. Then let P of S, we use this sort of function like it's a function, P like it's a function here, P of S, to mean the power set of S, the power set. Well, what is the power set? The power set is the set of all subsets of S. Okay. All right, let's just start with a simple uh, set here. Let's say that this is our set S. And I, I was talking about the power set of S. So let's see if we can come up with what's the power set of S. Now, it's the set of all subsets of S. So the interesting thing about the power set is it's a set of sets. This is something we haven't really reflected on yet. I said a set can be a set of anything. I said one important rule is a set can't be a member of itself. That's important. But a set could be a member of another set. So if we want to consider the set of all subsets of, of this set S, the first one is the empty set, which I'm going to use just open closed braces here. Okay first one is the subset. The first subset, rather, is the empty set that has size zero. Then I want to include maybe, maybe I'll do this on the next row, the sets of size one. So there's one, two, three, and four sets of size one. Well, now there's also subsets of size two. So let's consider them. So we'll get one, two, I'll do the ones with one first. One, three, one, four. Okay, now I'm going to do the ones with two. Now notice two, one has already been counted. Remember, order doesn't matter. So two, one's the same as one, two. We've got that. But we didn't get two, three. And we didn't get two, four, right? And, and then what else? Oh, we also forgot uh, three, four then. Okay, now we've got them all. We've got one, two, one, three, one, four. We've got two, one, two, three, two, four. We've got three, one, uh, three, two, and three, four. And we've got four, one, four, two, and uh, uh, four, three. Okay, so all pairs. Now, Remember, I put them in this order because this is the conventional order and we're not trying to double up where we have 1, 2, and 2, 1. Okay, so let's continue now. All the subsets of size 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, trying to be careful here. What else? 1, how about 2, 4? Okay, what about 1, 3, 4? Those are all the ones of size three that have a one in them. Okay, so now let's try the ones that don't have one. So we got the two, the uh, three, and the four. 
are there any more? Two, three, four. Well, because we're at size three, this is the only one that doesn't have a one in it. Okay. All right. Well, then now we also need the ones of size four. The whole set itself, remember, is a subset. Now, closing off this curly brace is closing off this one here because we have a set of sets here. How many do we have here? One, one, plus four, plus four, plus six here. And you might recognize this one, four, six, four, one, if you know what the triangular numbers are, okay, or if you know what the binomial distribution is. This is also known as Pascal's triangle. Um, but if we add up all these numbers, that's what we were interested in. Let's plus them all up here. Uh, what do we get? We get 10 plus another 6 is 16. There are 16 possible subsets of this subset of size 4, or this set of size 4. And so we've got ourselves a relationship here. We said that the size of S was 4. And the size of the power set of S was 16. Well, the relationship between these two, hopefully, um, those of us, especially the computer scientists in this, if this is n, this is 2 to the n. And this is actually quite large. Okay, the Exponential growth means that if we have a uh, set of size n, if we want to consider all the all the subsets, we end up with an exponential number of subsets. And this can be important to us, again, if, if you are a computer scientist, if your algorithm uh, or if the problem is try all the subsets or, or find a subset with this property and your only, your best uh, attempt is to try all the subsets, you're going to have an exponential number of subsets to check and that's a lot. We don't, usually don't want to do that. So that's the goal here uh, or why we're going to be looking at power sets might be because we might need to iterate over all of these to do some kind of task. Okay, so here we've got this relationship uh, between our, our, our set and its, the power set but also the size of our set and the power set. I think I've got this also here on the slide, so let's just go through it one more time. So if we've got this uh, set S, we listed our set of all uh, subsets. So I've got them listed here in this table. Uh, also quite clearly in this table 16, 4 by 4, right? Um, and so we did do this math al al already. Uh, if we have a set uh, S of size N, then the size of the power set will be 2 to the n. So now one way I can prove this to you, we just looked at it for one example, but one way that I can prove this to you is you can take a look here. When we're coming up with a subset for each of the four members that we have here, we're making a choice of whether to include that member or not include that member in the subset that we're creating. So if for each member we said no, 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 we end up with the empty set. If for each member we said yes, 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 we ended up with this subset, one, two, three, four. But if we said yes, no, yes, no, we ended up with this subset here, one, three. Okay, so every subset over here corresponds to a string of yeses and nos of length n. Or let's put that in binary terms, a, uh, a zero or a one, a zero if you're not in there, a one if you are, then that means a binary number of length four. How many binary numbers are there of length four? Two to the four, two to the n. So I've got the same logic here. Each one of these members, we have two choices, two times two times two times two. This is a counting argument that, that's based off of a, something called the product rule, um, where if you're trying to count independent choices, then you multiply the, the number of occurrences together. So here we've done that. We've got ourselves two to the n possible subsets. Again, not as important right now. We're just setting this up definitionally. What is the power set? What is its size? But as we push forward, if we encounter an algorithm where we need to you know, iterate over all of the uh, subsets, we should immediately say, OK, that's going to be an expensive algorithm. OK, here I've got another uh, a depiction of our numerical system. 
Uh, here's what we're using is called a Venn diagram. Now a Venn diagram is where we use circles uh, or ellipses in this case to represent a uh, represent a set. So here I've got the set of positive integers inside the set of natural numbers drawn this way because every positive integer is a natural number. Every natural number is an integer, so that's drawn n inside of, of z, and so on. z is a subset of q, the rational numbers, the rational numbers is a subset of the reals, and the reals are a subset of the complex numbers. And so that these number systems are sort of like a set of Russian nesting dolls where we keep getting sort of smaller and smaller as we go inside. On the outside, I have u. u is the universal set. We might have ahead of time said this is all numbers, or we might have said ahead of time this is all things, meaning there's uni unicorns out here. There's no unicorns in any of these shapes in here. Okay. So this is again a Venn diagram. You've probably encountered a Venn diagram online. There's many different, we use them to depict many different ideas in society. Um, so you've probably encountered them already. Um, let's use our Venn diagram to define a couple set theoretic operations. The first one here is the union of two sets. Okay, so here we have two sets, A depicted by this circle, B depicted by this circle, and then the union of A and B, which I've got depicted by the gray bit, is the whole, all of them put together. Now there's this part here that I've got in the middle, the way I've drawn them here, the way I've drawn A and B here is the standard way to draw them in a Venn diagram if you don't know anything about A and B. If you don't know that A is a subset of B or B is a subset of A or that they don't overlap, there's a possibility that they overlap and there's possibility that they have members that don't overlap. So we've drawn that here, but the union is then taking all the members of A or B. So let's take a look at the set builder definition because it, it, it uh, relies on the logic that we were talking about in the previous video. So first of all, A union B is depicted by this, we sometimes call this the cup, okay, this sort of uh, U shape here, right? Uh, A union B is equal to all the X's such that X is in A or X is in B. So take all the members of A and the members of B, put them all together in one bag and you'll get a union B. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about union in a little more, more detail. So let's remember our set of even numbers that we talked about earlier. Okay. And then we can redefine them using set builder notation now. Every even, even number is just a natural number multiplied by 2. So you get 2 times 0, you get 0. 2 times 1, you get 2. 2 times 2, you get 4, and so on. So you get all the natural numbers. We can let the odd numbers be defined as um, 1, 3, 5, and so on, also using set builder notation as 2 times a natural number plus 1. And this shows that you'll have a, a remainder of 1 if you divide by 2. That's the definition of an odd number. So we now have an even number and an odd number defined, or more precisely, the set of even numbers and the set of odd numbers defined. And then we might say, well, what happens if you union them? What if you take the evens and you union them to the odds? Well, Hopefully we probably know what that means. Every number is either even or odd, so we get the naturals back again, right? So here we're saying if we union them, we get the naturals. How do we prove this? Can we prove this? And how do we prove this? If we want to show two sets are equal, we want to show one is a subset of the other and vice versa again. This is this sort of piggybacks off of um, on, arithmetic and, and just numerical proofs of equality. If you want to prove that two numbers A and B are equal, one way to do that is show that A is less than or equal to B and that B is less than or equal to A. If that's the case, then if they're both less than or equal to each other, then it must be the case that they're equal to each other. And that's the idea that we're going to use here. And that's because we already have a definition of what it means for A to be a subset of B. That is, if X is in A, then X is in B. So uh, we're going to do these proofs. We're going to split them into two. So I need to prove both of these. This is an and. 
logically this is an and statement so normally we'll just prove this one first and then we'll prove this one second and then they go together we just sort of glue them together with the and so when we try and prove intermediary steps what we're truly trying to prove is is this the evens union the odds are, are the natural numbers but we're going to prove them in two steps one that the evens union the odds are a subset of the natural numbers and then we're going to turn this around, that the num natural numbers are, are a subset of the evens union the odds. So we have to prove those in two separate steps. And when we split them into these two steps, we'll often call them lemmas instead of theorems. So let's do lemma one, proving this one. All right, now remember, to prove a subset relationship, we need to prove that if x is a member of the first bit, the E union O, then x is an element of the natural number. So if so, we're gonna we need to prove that if it's a, a member of the evens union the odds, then x is either going to be or so then x is going to be in the natural number. So we're gonna start out by this. What was our definition of union? Our definition of union said this was what we just had on the previous slide that if x is in the union, it's either an even number or an odd number. And again, our internal brain computers probably are gonna spit that out and say, yeah, that makes sense. If you're in the union of even and odd, you're either even or you're odd. So we're gonna treat each of these as a separate case. We'll figure, we'll make our argument work for even first and then we'll do it for odd. So case one, let's assume x was an even. If it was even, then it's an even natural number. Remember what our definition of even is up here if you're in even then then you must be a natural number so thus x is a natural number and x must be in n same argument is going to work for odd except that we're going to be an odd natural number now okay and this is again going to argue that since you're an odd natural number you must be a natural number okay so if our x was even or if our x was odd it's a natural number so in both cases we know that we're in n Okay, so this established one direction of our proof. Again, some of you might be thinking, this seems very straightforward, this seems obvious, why do we need to write this down? Well, one, this is a very obvious proof. The reason why I'm going through the motions of doing this is more for us to practice and get familiar with what a proof structure looks like and feels like with something that is, is intuitive and makes sense before we jump into something that doesn't make as much sense. Okay, we'll jump. We'll try the ones that are intuitive first. So this is fairly straightforward. Um, and this does rely on one extra property, which is called the closure of the natural numbers. I'm going to talk about that in a future video. Okay, so it's not super important here, but it's sort of smuggled in underneath the scenes. Uh, okay, so this is, I guess, not our first proof. We did a proof earlier, so maybe this is our second proof. We'll call this a direct proof because it just it just argues from point A down to the conclusion. And then it is an exhaustive proof in that we broke it down into cases and we tried to prove each case one at a time. We exhausted all the cases. Let's do the other direction now. Are, is every natural number even or odd? Well, we hope they are, right? So let's take a look. So first of all, to prove this, we need to show that if X is in a natural number, then it is in even or odd. So what we're going to show is that uh, it, if x is a natural number, then it is either in E, or if x is a natural number, then it is in O. It's either in E or it's in O. So first of all, if we have our natural numbers, every natural number can either be written as 2k or 2k plus 1. How do we know this? If we needed to, we could sort of prove this on the side. Uh, and say maybe there's a number that has to be written as 2k plus 2. Well, we could show that that could be written it using a different k as just 2k and vice versa. So every natural number can be written in one of these two forms. So if it is equal to 2k, well, this was what our definition of the set E was. So it must be an even natural number. So if our natural number happened to be of this form, we know it's in the set E. If it happened to be of the alternate form, 2k plus 1, then we know it must have been in the set O. That's what we were trying to prove. No matter what, it was going to be in either E or O. So once again, we are done. So what we've proven here, again, breaking it down into all of its simplest little pieces, is that the set of even numbers, when combined with the set of odd numbers, is equal to the set of natural numbers. Okay. 
All right, so I think I talked about what a lemma is. It's an intermediary proposition that we prove in order uh, to prove some other theorem, a different theorem. So this was the theorem we were actually trying to prove, that they're equal. But we'll just say, hey, by the definition of what it means to be equal, uh, that is using these two subsets, uh, we've already proved these two subset relationships in, in lemma one and lemma two. So usually we'll just say, by lemma one and lemma two, the theorem follows and we're done. And when we have a very, very quick, simple theorem like this that follows usually just by previous proofs we've done, um, we usually call this a corollary, which is just, again, a simple sort of secondary conclusion. All right, so we were talking about union there. Let's look at another definition. Uh, what about the intersection? So this darker area here, the overlap area, is what we call the intersection. So here, again, A intersect B, with this symbol, we sometimes call it the cap, is, um, again, defined here, all the X's, such that X is in A and X is in B. It's in this overlap part. It's in A and it's in B, okay? That's the definition of the interlap, or sort of the intersect. So what happens if we take the intersection between the evens and the odds? Well, there's no number that is even and odd, so we have, uh, we have nothing here. Okay, the intersect is empty, the empty set. Okay. When the intersection between two sets is empty, we say that those two sets are disjoint. Disjoint is just, a, again, another terminology, another piece of jargon that we used. So if you say, hey, these two sets are disjoint, that means they have no elements in common, their intersection is empty. E and O, the even numbers and the odd numbers, are an example of what we will call a partitioning of the natural numbers. A partitioning is a way that we split a set into subsets where those subsets have special properties. And there's two important properties. One of them is that they are disjoint, mutually disjoint. So E and O are disjoint. The other property to become a partition is that if we union all the sets together, you get back the original set, N, that is, all of the elements are accounted for. And so we call this a partitioning. So here I've got the definition for a two partition, where we just have two sets, A and B partition S. If they're both subsets, the intersection of the two is empty, and the union of the two is the original set. Okay, and we call this pairwise disjoint, and together exhaustive. Okay, that's this property here. We can extend this to uh, larger size partitions that where we don't just partition into size two. We can have a K size partition, we'll call that a K partition, where any two of those partitions have to be disjoint when we intersect them. But if we take them all together in one big union, we get the original set back again. And we call these a partition or partitioning. Okay, so that's another definition of interest uh, related to intersect. We can also do what's called a set different. That's where you take a set and you remove out all the elements uh, that are elements of a different set. So here I've got A minus B, A set difference B. And here I've got A set difference B with um, this gray area here, this sort of interesting gray area is what's left over of A after we subtract out the parts that were in B, the overlapping bits. Okay. And the definition here still has a logical uh, definition. It's, it, if you wish, it's got a but in it instead of an and. Remember when we were talking about logic in a previous video, I said when we have and not, in English at least, and in other languages, we have a word for that. We call it but, but, and we say but not instead of and not. But and and but mean the same thing, except that but carries this extra connotation. So here we could say all the elements X such that X are X is in A, but not in B, or and not in B, same thing, okay, but not in B. So this is a set difference. This is sort of the set version of the minus operator. If you think of union as maybe being the plus, this might be the minus. And then we also have the complement now, all the other operators only, they were binary operators, they took two arguments. This is a unary operator, only takes one argument. The complement of A also understands some universe. 
So sometimes we take the complement with respect to the whole universe. So say here, A is the set of natural numbers. If we're taking the complement against the whole universe, then outside here are, for instance, integers, but also unicorns. Sometimes we want to take the complement uh, against some narrower universe, like just numbers, in which case we might say, again, this is a natural numbers, uh, but we're taking the complement with respect to all numbers, in which case we end up with minus, minus one and pi and so on, other non-natural numbers, but no unicorns. So sometimes when taking the complement, we need to have to state the complement with respect to which other set. If we don't state the other set, we assume it's the universal set. All right, so in set theory, with using some of the uh, uh, set connectors now, these are, uh, we had logic, logical connectors before, we can think of uh, arithmetic operators as arithmetic connectives, and we can think of these set operators as set connectives. Um, we have a couple here, um, and then we can define rules that are related to the rules we saw before. So we had minus minus a is a, not not p is p, and the complement of the complement of a is a again. And a lot of these ones, at least these ones here, line up with their logical equivalencies, which again lined up with their arithmetic equivalencies that I mentioned before. So A intersect the universal set is just A back again. A union the empty set, add nothing in them, gives you nothing back again, or gives you A back again. A union the universal set, this is the dominating ones, right? A union the, the universal set, the universal set dominates. Who cares what was in A before? We end up with union. Same thing with intersect. Intersect with something empty, you get the empty set back. Um, commutative property, doesn't matter what order we use these operators. Okay. Associative, brackets don't matter when unioning or intersecting. Okay. And then we do have distributive laws with set theory as well. So we have A, union, the intersect of B and C, is A union B and A union C intersected. Interesting, okay? And again, similarly for the other uh, order. So these are all, again, as you're uh, hopefully practicing some of your logical ones uh, previous, you can do the same thing with set equivalents. You can prove set relationships using these in the same way you could set, uh, prove logical equivalences using Boolean algebra using these definitions. Okay, and then finally, uh, just like the logical case, uh, we do have a couple here. Um, the Morgan's Law for set theory still works the same. Okay, the item potent law, uh, A union A, A intersect A just gives you back A again. Okay, interesting absorption law, A union A intersect B is just going to be A again. Okay, remember this is this A intersect B is already a subset of A, so we just get A back again if we union it, union it in. Uh, a, un, or a intersect A union B, so here we've taken A all and all A and B, put them together, and we intersected it with just A, we get A back again. Okay, and again, uh, some negation, union A with its complement, you get everything. Intersect A with its complement, you get nothing. Okay. So this video, a little bit longer video, is intended to be an introduction to set theory. It is certainly not an exhaustive list of everything you can find in set theory. Set theory is considered to be a foundation of all mathematics. So, so uh, there's the idea that everything in mathematics eventually comes down to sets at the bottom level. Um, we're not going to break everything down to those uh, base principles, but we are going to use set theory in some of the uh, some of the you know, algorithms we're going to define, problems we're going to define, um, when we start talking about interesting data structures like graphs and so on, all of these things we're going to we're going to go back to set theory and rely on set theory as our foundation to define what these different mathematical structures are. So this is our foundation, this is getting us started, and for the rest of this series of videos you should expect us to reach back and touch on logic and sets uh, from time to time. Okay, that's all I wanted to say in this video, so thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.